Hello. Thank you for joining us. And today we have one of our favorites, Siri Stroman, pastor of Atonement Lutheran Church in Bloomington, Minnesota. Hello, Siri. Hello. Nice to be here. Thanks for joining us once again. So I love hearing Siri on. She is, as I said, a pastor in a Lutheran church, traditional, but Siri's not so traditional. <laughs> so, but she is in traditional religion. And as I always say, I'm not, not interested, was for a long, long time, but still very, very interested in spirituality. Still have some uh, Christian beliefs, just not religious beliefs. I do believe Jesus existed. I believe he came to show us a different way of living. And I believe we didn't like it so much. So we killed him. So anyway, because we didn't want to do that work of taking on the responsibility for our own life. So we were like, let's get rid of this guy. <laughs> so here's kind of what I wanted to talk about today, Siri. We are so divided, obviously. The world, yes, but definitely in our country. Um, it's, you know, us and them, us and them. Um, there's there's a, a party that... Uh, you know, they say they're Christian family values party um, and want to go back to a way of life that, quite frankly, I don't think existed. I think we all kind of have a habit of looking at the past with rose colored glasses mm -hmm. and ignoring like I'm six of seven kids. Like my oldest sister is like 17 years older than I am. So she started coming of age in like the 50s. And, you know, she'll talk about what a great time it was, you know, and this and that, you didn't have to lock your doors. And it was, and mm. I'm, I'm always like, okay, that sounds wonderful. But do you think if I asked blacks what it was like for them, the fifties would be as great as you say, with the whites only signs everywhere yeah. who couldn't get alone on their own. So we yeah. kind of have a way of looking at the past and, and painting it with a very rosy brush. Mm -hmm. But I see this this segment of the population in America that it, it's almost like I get they're angry. Hey, we're all angry. Things are not set up properly and it's causing a lot of pain on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like life sucked for me, so it should suck for you too. Mm -hmm. I had to spend 10 years paying off my student loan, so you should too. Why should you have it any easier? And it's like this festering anger where... On the other side, we're trying to find a way to be more inclusive, to take care of more people. We know communism doesn't work. We've seen the communist countries. We're not advocating communism, but we're just asking for a more fair and just and inclusive way of existing in this world. Mm -hmm. The thing that I always think about, and this has really been kind of on my mind the last week, and that is two of the things that Jesus said. He said, did I not say ye are gods, mm -hmm. right? And he said, greater things than I have done, will you do? Mm -hmm. Now, I spent the first 35, 36 years of my life enmeshed in Catholicism and Catholic teachings and teaching CCD and, and, and years and years of, of uh, Catholic school education. And yes, we did hear these things, but also everywhere we turned, there was like crosses with this bloody Jesus hanging on it. Like this reminder of you did this, you should mm -hmm. feel guilty. You need to atone for your sins. And I always mm -hmm. found it interesting that we chose that symbol instead of like an empty tomb with a white sheet in it as a symbol yes. of resurrection and new life and freedom. And I do believe there's a there's a reason for that. And so this this kind of ties in. I'm taking the long way around, but I'm not going anywhere. You going anywhere? <laughs> okay, so I was thinking about how we've set up our lives based on this, this symbolism of we're born in original sin. We're here to earn our way back to heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be judged by our deeds. Um, and he will either go to heaven or hell. So there's always this hanging over us. And we've set up this life. And this is what puzzles me. Why are we fighting to keep living this same life? Which is basically, we start, we start at five years old. 
being trained to conform, to get in line, to mm -hmm. sit still, to follow bells. This bell rings, get up. This stand, cross your heart, uh, recite this pledge. I don't, do they still do that in schools? I don't even know, Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and then from there, and, and we always have bosses. We always have someone telling us what to do. We go from our parents and then we go to teachers mm -hmm. and then we go to work and our bosses. And it's, we're already used to the bells and the time clocks. And what really sparked this is sometimes I like to read like funny tweets that, yeah. you know, on YouTube, you can go on and they'll just have 10 minutes. People just kill me with their sense of humor. I can't believe how funny they are sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I was reading one about work memes and over mm -hmm. and over, it was just people talking about how much they hate getting up, how much they hate going to work every day. Mm -hmm. And it started me thinking, we are trained to believe that we are meant to spend our lives getting up five out of seven days and going places we don't want to go. And to be quite honest, six out of seven days, because you're supposed to go to church on Sunday, right? Throw mm -hmm. some gifts in there. If you don't make it to church, put mm -hmm. your own basket. That's really what that's all about. Um, sorry, I know you're a pastor. <laughs> 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 not the series church, not series church. But, you know, I, I'm going from my experience of the Catholic church. But so we're so well trained that life sucks and then you die. Maybe work for 40, 45 years, however long it is, 50 for some people. And if you're lucky and still in good health and have saved enough money, maybe you get the last 10, 20 years to actually enjoy your life. And I do not understand why people are fighting to keep this way of life instead of saying, this has been set up all wrong, especially because the people who make the decisions for us about how much money we will make and how long our work week should be and things like that, they have a great life. They are way more than making minimum wage. They are mm -hmm. definitely making a livable wage. Mm -hmm. I think it's senators. I don't know about uh, representatives, but they only have to work like five years and they're guaranteed a pension. Imagine yeah. that. Yeah. These are the people that stand there and say, we can't have these people living off the government. It's exactly what they're doing. We really need to start looking at how well trained we've been. Mm -hmm. we have people in charge of us telling us what we can and can't do and mm -hmm. wrapping in, in this religious righteousness and this, this holy decree that we're here to cleanse ourselves of, orig of original sin and then make our way back to this magical heaven where then finally all these struggles we went through on earth will be worth it. And mm -hmm. I've said this before, but it seems to me the people that preach that are living pretty nice lives. <laughs> They're not struggling and sacrificing. Um, the people in charge of all these churches and, and these political organizations have really nice lives and and the the biggest one is like i said the people we put in charge tell us they get us to judge and condemn others for doing what they're doing mm -hmm. which is putting off the government they have great health care mm -hmm. there's a reason our health care is tied to our jobs mm -hmm. that's how they get away with shitty wages mm -hmm. because if we had universal health care People would say, I'm not taking this job for this crappy amount of money. But when they say, at least I have health care, it's all part and parcel of it. Same with the military. It's why we don't have college paid for. Because if mm -hmm. you're willing to risk life and limb, then you get a free college education. They're not going to pay for it because who are they going to get to fight in their wars? Mm -hmm. That makes the rich richer. Yeah. So anyway, it's kind of what I want to unpack in our Christian belief system is how intertwined it is also with our political system and, and not in the way people want and certainly not in a good way. But where did we get off the road, Siri, of ye are gods and greater things than I have done will you do to these people who are just eking out this existence until we die and then hoping to get to heaven and enjoy ourselves? Yeah. Gosh, there's so much in there. And I think it's best to just literally start back at the beginning with Jesus in, in the way I understand what he was trying to tell people. 
You know, he has this beautiful line. It's one of my favorite lines. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. And that means now, I mean, he, he, he wasn't talking about heaven in that way. He was talking about life now, which can extend beyond, but so much of we read back decisions that were made later to focus so much on heaven and hell. We read those back into the Bible and go, well, yeah, there he is. He was talking about that. What so much of Jesus was talking about and dealing with was right here on earth. He was confronting the suffering that people were having by healing them. His parables and a lot of the things he said were way more politically charged than what we give them credit for because we don't often understand the references unless you have someone with a degree who really knows that culture. You know, they can tell you that Luke, for example, is an incredibly politically charged book. Um, and a lot of the parables that we think are very sweet had huge ramifications for the people listening. So Jesus was confronting any oppressive system, whether it's religious or economic or spiritual. And he wanted for people's lives to be good and better now. He wanted harmony within and harmony without both, because that's how you get it. You can't have peace on earth without having peace in here. And peace in here inevitably leads to people wanting to create more peace in the outer world. So, so much of what he, he does, he talks about this world and he, he asks that his disciples do what he's doing, heal people, care for people. He wanted an inner transformation where people felt connected to the divine. They felt connected to their neighbor and themselves. And there was a restoration of what had been splintered. What's interesting about that is that very quickly in the early church, there were all these different perspectives. Um, and more and more and more, which happens in every religion and belief system, the prophet starts to get deified over the message being followed. Mm -hmm. And so it became more important, especially as you've mentioned before, in the Constantine time when the church came into power and all of a sudden all the men were gathered, the women not so much, the men were gathered to make decisions of what is Christianity, to put together the Nicene Creed, decide what made it in the Bible. And in these decisions, you had, uh, you really had a filtering out of anything that they felt wasn't going to be a part of this new mainstream. This is what Christianity is. Um, and so as that progressed in time and the church was in power, a lot more decisions were made regarding the church being the filter through which everybody learns everything. And part of that um, became an um, overemphasis on heaven and hell. And so, yeah, if life was hard and life was difficult, at least you could say, hey, well, it's, it's okay if it sucks now because you're going to get to go to heaven. Um, so there was maybe a little hope in that in bad times, but there is a level of sort of control. Why would we make this world better now for you? If that's what Jesus, you know, why would we make this world better for you? If really the focus is on the other world. Um, so once again, that, that focus was shifting away to something else. And we even see this in um, how threads throughout Christianity of just the ascetic being without departing from the earthly world and our earthly desires and, mm -hmm. you know, not being tempted by food and sex and women and money. And, and all of this is being holy, that separateness is being holy. And that was lifted up above other things. And you can see this in the Puritans and other certain um, traditions that almost seem to see pleasure as being bad. And then you mix that at least in America with capitalism, which is about efficiency and it is about um, being able to capitalize on the most that you can possibly get. And it's not about meaning and it's not about the, you can't measure happiness very well. You can't measure purposefulness, but you can measure the bottom line, how many units we sold. You can measure that. So all of a sudden we're in this culture where we have all these years behind. That's like, you know what? Heaven is the focus after all. Um, 
it doesn't matter what happens here on earth. And then you mix it in with like all these capitalistic ideas of you are your production. Your worth is tied to production and, and the time you spend at work. Um, and you, yeah, you have people who are wondering what this is for. What is the point of all of this? Which is incredibly sad when Jesus came to help us find an abundant and beautiful life. Oh, you said so much there. And you touched on something that um, the uh, political party on the right seems obsessed with, and that is sex, actually yeah. having sex, I should say. Um, you know, it's interesting because uh, they're going after birth control next. That's part of that. I don't know if you've seen that, that 1925 manifesto or whatever, which is like, terrorizing what all the things they want to implement and part of it is not only completely doing away with abortion but also birth control and there is thought behind that it has nothing to do with holiness or sacredness or an act between them it has to do with making more programmed people that believe what they believe and keeping women in their houses and their mouths shut because mm -hmm. they do not like uppity women with big mouths and big ideas mm -hmm. So I do want to talk about sex. Uh, this, oh my God, this this speaker Johnson, him and his son. Have you heard this? Have these things? Yeah, on yeah. Phones <laughs> where they masturbate or look at porn. They learn <laughs> each other like, how psychotic is that? I don't. Uh, they are so obsessed with other people's sex life. Who's mm -hmm. having sex? Who they're having it with? Where they're having it? What position they're having it in? Mm -hmm. It's really astounding. And the thing that I find most interesting is it's it's really, and this certainly has creeped into all, uh, all society, is it's really more of a judgment on women, how often we have sex and, and mm -hmm. men not so much. That's kind of their, it's expected for them to be sexual beings. We are not. We are supposed mm -hmm. to just be receptacles for mm -hmm. their sperm and then incubators for their children. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is we are the ones who have that organ that has no other purpose except sexual pleasure. Yep. They don't, men don't have that. We have that. And the fact that women still, I think it's only between 60 and 75%, something like that of women that achieve orgasm. So mm. that tells how messed up we are in our set heads partly. And then also partly um, could have something to do with the fact that men are so divorced from all their tender feelings and don't really know how to communicate with women or, or women to communicate with them about what's pleasing for them. But I find it really interesting that it, you mentioned about pleasure, anything that's pleasurable. And I think one of the biggest questions we have to ask ourselves is, when did we start buying into the belief system that God is joyless? Right. God is not a supporter of fun, good mm -hmm. times, laughter. I can tell you, you know, growing up in the Catholic church, I would not have it any other way. Honestly, the friends I made, I, I mean, all the dogma and everything, that was a lot to deal with. I wouldn't send my kids now, um, but it really, there, there were good things about it. I, I don't want to just say only negative things. There were certainly some uh, good things about it. But growing up in the Catholic Church, there was no sense of uh, female expression, sexuality. The nuns, I mean, they bound their breasts. They wore mm -hmm. like the ugliest black shoes you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, straight black dress, cover your hair, shave your head, cover your hair, no makeup. Like it, it's everything is about repression, repression. I think the only thing you were allowed to enjoy was prayer time and singing right. hymns, maybe. Honestly, I don't ever remember hearing anything about Jesus being a joyful, robust, happy kind of being. And I do think think there are uh testimonies that um reject that you know because you're a scholar but I feel like I've heard of different people saying 
that Jesus, you know, he loved to laugh and, and, and he wasn't a poor, broke um, being that, that he actually did have some means and really enjoyed life. Can you, um, yeah, the, I mean, um, theoretical facts onto that, that it's not just something that I'm imagining. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's this great passage in Luke where Jesus is um, reflecting on how, what people say about him. And they say, oh, yeah, you you called John the Baptist uh, this particular thing. And you call me a glutton and a drunkard because I go to all these parties. Um and he's just sort of like, what are you going to do? You're going to think of me what you think of me. But that was a really interesting passage because we do see throughout the Gospels how Jesus is always having dinner with people and how he makes wine at this wedding, which is that story of the wedding of Cana is such a beautiful metaphor. Wine was seen as a symbol of joy and of spirit. And so the fact that he makes more of it, he turns ordinary wine, water into wine, has so many metaphorical implications. And so, yeah, we don't have an example necessarily where it's like Jesus laughed, LOL. Like we don't, we don't have that, but we have, we have the implication. Plus there's the simple logic that most of the quote, holy people that I know and have met and in my own internal work of discovering my the true self inside, that there is joy is one of those things. We even have it as a spiritual fruit. So it, joy is one of the spiritual fruits. So basically, the more in touch you are with the wavelength of God, joy is part of that. And one more thing, I, I, I taught a class on Monday where we talked about the masculine and feminine energies. And... One of the things that's interesting, I believe Jesus was really balanced. He was a very healthy masculine because mm -hmm. he embraced his femininity. And we all have masculine and feminine image, you know, energies within us. But one of the beauties of feminine energy, which has been really demonized in our world and in our culture, is that it is connected with earth. It is connected with emotion. It is connected with coziness and nurturing. It is connected with food and sexuality. So a lot of the things that masculine spirituality has been focused on, you know, meditating and being ascetic and being away from this, feminine spirituality would say, actually, we're here for a reason in our bodies. We're here to enjoy this earth experience is important. We're not in a flesh jail. We are here for a reason to learn and to explore through our bodies and joy is means you're kind of in the right vibe of things. Um, so that's part of our wholeness. I think that when we are lacking joy, part of it is there's that overemphasis of that masculine do, do, produce, produce, go, go, go. Mm -hmm. And what we really do need to do is find that time to rest and receive and relax and laugh and be goofy because that's holy too. Holy is our birthright of, of realizing who we are and living in, in that whole complete, full exploration and expression of who we're made to be. It's really, really powerful what you just said. You know, it makes me think you know, obviously I say this all the time. I, I absolutely believe this is the, the time of the reemergence of the divine feminine, the rebalancing, like you said, the masculine. And there's nothing wrong with the mas masculine. Nope. There's really nothing wrong. You know how they say everything in moderation? Exactly. There's nothing. But we we have so overdone the masculine yep. and just squashed down the divine feminine. And that's where the balance is, the lightness, the laughter. Scientists say, I'm not a scientist, but I believe people who are that say we're all actually swirling masses of energy. We're just vibrating so fast we look solid. Yes. Yeah. You know, like say someone invited you, another couple invited you and your husband for dinner. You know, you can walk in that house and they could be, hi, how are you? And in your gut, you're like, holy shit, they were fighting. Something is way off. <laughs> you can feel it, right? 
You can yep. feel it in the air. So we all know you can go sit in church as I did thousands and thousands of days myself at a mass, solemn mass, kneeling, standing, repeating, whatever. Not that it's a bad thing. It gives people great comfort. It gave me comfort for a very long time. And that's nice. But I wouldn't say there were very few occasions I left there feeling different. I felt relieved of guilt because I was like, okay, that's over with for another week or whatever. I got, I got that on my sacred duty. So I don't die with a mortal sin on my soul and, and go to hell um, as our, the dogma teaches us. But then think about when you're with a bunch of old friends or family for the evening and you're having some drinks, maybe you're playing a game and you are laughing so hard. You're in tears. You're laughing so hard. Your stomach hurts. Think of how you feel when you leave there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the difference between feeling joy and that, that energy is, is so catchy. When you go to a concert, I love going to live concerts. I do it all the time. And sometimes I'm on the main floor, but sometimes I'll be like right in the front of the balcony because I like that because I can kind of see everything and I got room if I want to start dancing or whatever. And sometimes I just take it in and I'm just like, this place is just filled with joy. Like, look at everybody's faces. They're smiling. I mean, how can we think that this is a place God would not be? Because yeah. we, have, we have been trained to believe in a God that doesn't exist. That I will die on that hill. That mm -hmm. God we've been trained to believe. That judgmental, white-bearded man in the sky who's watching us, making sure we cross every T and dot every I. He was invented because people wanted power over other people mm -hmm. and they wanted to get rich, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever it was. They wanted power. They wanted money, control. That God is nowhere near the God that I've experienced since I have stopped seeking inside the confines of religion and just kind of opened myself up to mm -hmm. wherever it leads me. And, you know, people will say there's no proof. And I always say that, too. Prove me wrong. You can't prove me wrong. I can't prove you wrong. You can't prove me wrong. We can't prove each other right. All we can do is go by our experience. However, what I do always say is there are millions of people. All you got to do is go on YouTube and put in near-death experiences. Mm. And listen to what these people say. Some of these people were dead for 45 minutes, an hour. That was it. Some of them, there was one guy that he had the sheet over him. And, you know, he came back in his body and he couldn't move. So he was just blowing on the sheet because he was in the morgue. <laughs> the guy. Can you imagine being the guy in the morgue? And that would be crazy. The sheet blown up. So, so he pulled the sheet <laughs> back and he was back. But 99.9% .9 of the time, with very few exceptions, they talk about an encounter with a loving being so filled with joy and acceptance all those rules and regulations and have tos and musts don't even exist over there. They're not even part of what whatever this next phase of our journey is. Mm -hmm. So if we can open up our minds to actually believing, maybe we're supposed to be happy here. Yeah. Maybe we're supposed to learn to love and accept ourselves in all our humanness instead of constantly berating ourselves and sharing apps with our kids so we don't look at porn, which is, I can't even imagine, I can't even imagine living like that. Mm -hmm. um, and being so obsessed with other people's sex lives. Did Jesus ever say anything about other people's sex lives? I, I don't think he did, but you would know more than me. So ironically, uh, awesome story in John was when they bring before a woman caught in adultery Ah, there you go. Of course, they don't bring the man. They bring mm -hmm. the woman because it's really yeah. fun to stone a woman for sexual, you know, impropriety. Yeah. And of course, Jesus' response is just golden. He he just doesn't bite. And he says, you without sin cast the first stone. And then he walks up to her when everyone's left. And he says, I don't condemn you. Go, you know, go and live your life. It's such a powerful, powerful story. Um there's a couple other little stories here and there, but if Jesus says anything about sexuality, he, it's usually incredibly feminist. It's usually on, on the side of women who he obviously saw 
being treated as property more than as human beings. And every interaction Jesus had with a woman is groundbreaking, radical, and feminist for its time, which somehow gets completely overlooked by um, certain groups of people. But going back to what you said, which I think was powerful, when I think about the moments that have brought me such joy and peace, I I can remember certain days like where I, I took my kids on a trip, just a day trip. And the whole day we were laughing together. We didn't, nobody was fighting. It was just easy like water. We were just going with the flow together. Oh, do you want to go in that store? Okay, let's go in this store. Let's have lunch. Laughing. There was no, I was driving home that day and the kids fell asleep in the back of the car. This was just a couple of years ago. And I remember I had such peace in my heart. And I looked at this world with like the fall colors and the trees. And I was like, this is perfect. And in that moment, the other moments I've had like that, I'm like, this was a perfect day. This was a perfect day. It's always these simple, beautiful moments that are very earthly. It's relational. It's beautiful time with people. It's the laughter. It's climbing a mountain and being sweaty and then having a gorgeous dinner on a deck where you're looking over the mountains and you're just like, this is why we're here, is to have these gorgeous moments and to connect with each other and to learn powerful lessons that, yeah, some of these lessons aren't fun, but we're not supposed to. It does no one any good to stay stuck in, in depression. If you think about it this way, there's a, two metaphors I have. One is you're a boss and you've got 10 workers under you. Now imagine those workers coming to work just like demoralized and depressed and they're just trying to get through the day and you just can't really get much out of them. You, you're not tapping into their creativity. You know, they're snipping at each other. That's not what you'd want. That's not an ideal company. What you would want is for people to come bursting with new ideas, laughing, making jokes with each other, collaborating. That's a, why would God want us then to be suffering and at our worst selves and demoralized, right? And the second thing is too, like if you had a kid, if those of you listening have a kid in your life, it doesn't have to be your biological child, who came up to you and said, I feel worthless. I feel awful. Like, I don't want to get out of bed. That would raise alarms. You would be so sad for them. What you'd want for your kid is for them to wake up and be like, I can't wait to see this friend. I can't wait for this class. I can't wait to come home and read this book or do this project that I, I love. Like, you want to see the joy of life in them. Why would God be less loving and compassionate than us? Surely God wants everyone on the planet lit up and excited and laughing and ready to collaborate and share whatever gift they have. And part of what I think we have going on in our culture is not just these deep religious roots of, you know, suffer now and go to heaven later. But I really do think that we have a lack of imagination in our capitalistic society that we think this is as good as it gets. We're taught this is it. There's no other way it can be. And the minute you start talking about a better way, you're called a socialist or a communist or a Marxist or whatever. And it's really, we need to question those responses. We need to question the world can look different. It really can. It may not be perfect, but it can look so much better. People can find jobs that they like for the most part and get paid really well. There's enough money for everyone to be paid 80, 90, $100,000 a year. Even if you work at McDonald's, there's actually enough money for that. There's enough money for us to work 30 hours instead of 40, 50, 60, 70. There is enough. And once we stop believing the lie that there's not, or this is the only way it can be, and start demanding more for all of us and putting up boundaries. And there's so many things we can collectively do and individually do to find that joy that is our birthright. We're meant to live and explore and experience this earth in a good way. You said a mouthful there, sister. Um, you, you touched on a couple things that I actually think about and, and believe myself. 
Um, I want to see how I want to address this. So Siri, one of the things I most always want to do with the conversations that I have on this show is question things. Question, why do we believe what we believe? I think that's the key to everything because so much of our lives, we're just sleepwalking. We're just doing it because this is what we were told we were supposed to do. I remember this, this story. I don't know if you've heard it. People tell it like it's true, but I doubt it's true because I've heard it so many different places. But like there was a... Um, they were all gathered together for Sunday dinner, all the generations of the family. And um, the little girl watched her mom. Um, they had a huge roast yeah, and yeah. she cut off the ends, right? Put it in the pan and then put the ends on the side. And the little girl said, mommy, how come you cut the roast like that? And then put the ends on the side of the pan. And she said, I, I don't know, that's the way grandma always taught me. And grandma was there. So she said to grandma, grandma, how come uh, mommy cuts the sides of, of the roast and then puts them on the, uh, cuts the ends of the roast and puts them on the side. And she said, well, that's the way your great, great grandma always taught me how to make it. So she asked great grandma, great grandma, how come we cut the ends off and then put them on the side? And she said, oh, I never had a pan big enough to fit the whole roast in. So, you know, a lot of times things start out for a specific reason and we just blindly keep following them, even though they're not necessary anymore. And I, I really feel like that's a lot of what's happening in our society today is we have outgrown a lot of these old beliefs, traditions, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, religious beliefs about who and what God is and what our purpose is here. I really feel like we're outgrowing them. And I feel a lot of people are very scared of change because as human beings, we are, we're scared of change. And it's much easier to keep things as they are than start looking inside ourselves and also questioning people in authority outside of ourselves because boy we're trained very well to just obey and follow the rules and not question but I really feel the only way humanity is going to continue to evolve at this point is to start questioning everything mm -hmm. and I think one of the biggest questions we should be asking is why do we believe God wants us unhappy why do we believe when we're really happy that the other shoe is going to drop. And mm. everything you said, I think that all the time about being a parent, because traditional Christianity says, you know, God is our father. We are his children. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily believe in that um, language, but that's what we're taught to believe. So we're taught to believe this father who loves us has very specific rules we need to follow. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, He's going to throw us in a place of burning hellfire forever. I'm mm -hmm. only a human being, and I would never do that to either right. of my children. I can't even think of anything my children could do that would make me disown them or send them somewhere so they could be tortured for mm -hmm. eternity. Mm -hmm. It's really, it has no logic behind it. Mm -hmm. And certainly anyone who's ever had the experience of meditating or excuse me, or praying or being in any kind of ceremony or anything and had that, that those moments of, of true connection, excuse me, where you feel so one with the divine that it, it literally brings tears to your eyes and makes you weep. That love is so overwhelming. There is not a speck in there of you should be doing this. Well, you better make sure you do that or I'm done with you. That is all stuff that's made up. Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff that we have to question in order to live the lives that I believe that we're destined to live. We can't live them within the confines of the way the society is set up. It's not set up for us, our happiness. And most religions aren't either. Mm -hmm. Really not. If you peel back and keep following the money, there's usually someone, God, I was just watching a documentary the other day that some of these evangelical televangelists have like $52 million jets because God said they needed it. God said they needed it. <laughs> they needed that 52. God's like, not told me that yet. <laughs> right. 
but yet they convince their followers to give them money and sacrifice for them. We have to look at how we've been trained. Like I said, from the time we're five, we're trained to follow the rules, conform, don't stand out. That's the worst thing, right? When you're a kid, when your kids were growing up, your kids are still in school. When kids make fun of them because they're different, right? They're standing out. They're not being like the other kids. I think it's getting better these days. They're a little more accepting, but also the pushback is harder because mm -hmm. that, you know, that um, push, pull, push, pull. There's so many people. They don't, they don't want things to change, even though things are not built for our best personal growth and happiness. There's still people that are clinging to the way it was simply because that's the way they were taught it's supposed to be. And that's the truth without ever questioning, do I believe this? Because I've done the examination in my own soul and I believe this is true or is this just what everybody's been telling me is true? So that's what I keep following. Yeah, so I have two thoughts on that. One is um, there was a really interesting study that was done on the different regions of the United States. And there's a whole region kind of in the South that sort of had this belief that like, we're all standing in line waiting for the wealth. And you just have to wait your turn. You work really hard individually and eventually it's going to come to you. And anytime someone like you becomes wealthy, it's sort of like, okay, they did it. I can do it too. And, and a lot of this perspective is, is deeply both racist and sexist in that um, the people at the back of the line are, you know, black people, indigenous people, Hispanic women. And anytime one of them succeeds, it's like they skip the front of the line. And so there, there's this subconscious reaction of like, no, no, I'm the one who's supposed to succeed next. Even if this person is in, living in poverty and, and, and doesn't have their you know, threadbare clothes and whatnot, they still feel like at least I'm white and I'm, I'm in line. So there's a real subconsciousness to the change that's happening in our world um, in terms of race and gender and who's getting ahead that, that sort of freaks people out. But on the religious side of things, there's, there's a really another interesting piece here. Um, and I just give me one second as I recall what it is I was going to try to say about that. Um, oh yeah. So there is a deep ingrained fear of hell and the judgment of God in a lot of people and this idea of, but if that all signs, sounds nice, Mary and Siri, but what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? Then, then I'm going to spend the rest of my life, you know, in eternal damnation. So as you were talking, it made me think about actually the story of the prophet Muhammad. And in the time in which he lived um, in Saudi Arabia, it was an incredibly violent time in which tribes were basically at war with each other. You know, one would steal a goat, the other would come back and kill the guy's wife. Then they'd do a raid and kill four people. And it was this escalating violence. You know, women were nothing. Baby girls were buried alive because they weren't worthy. When Muhammad started getting his revelations, one of the first revelations he got was this idea of the day of reckoning the day in which you stand before God by yourself, not with your tribe, because they would hide behind their, your tribe. You know, it's like a gang, you know, mm -hmm. you mess with me, you, you mess with, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a brand new idea that was absolutely needed in that culture where he started talking. He, he literally introduced the concept of the one God and the fear of that one God and therefore we have respect. Women need to be treated well. You know, when Muhammad had a, a baby daughter born, he went out and showed her to the community and kissed her so that everyone could see these girls have value, okay? In that time, the revelations he received, including a little bit of fear of hell, was sort of like what the medicine for the time needed to be. Now we have so many people with religious trauma who have deep feelings of fear and worthlessness, shame and guilt that they're carrying around. It is the opposite of the climate in which we had before. 
And so I, I want people to think about it from that point of view that prophets come and speak to the time. And it really helps for us to look at what was going on in that culture that they were specifically speaking to. And as you said, the divine feminine, I think, is rising again. And part of that is returning us to a deep internal healing we need and, and restoring us to you're worthy, you're beloved. Um, you don't have to be afraid. Um, and I just, I'm just wanted to offer that because I think some people, it is so ingrained of like suffer through this life and at least I can please God. Um, that's not the only way to think. And a lot of people who have pushed that themselves have fear and that's the only thing that they know how to push or they have an agenda because people who are afraid are very easy to control. That's it right there. Say if someone is preaching division and hatred and pointing at a specific group of people and saying they're the problem, you're not following God's will. You're following that person's personal agenda. And if you look close enough, that person's probably lining their pockets with the money they get from keeping you afraid and controlled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's one other thing that, that I wanted to touch on. Let me see, how, how do I want to put this? So here's the thing that people tend to say when they hear people say things like you and I are saying, like we're meant to be joyful, we're not, there is not a God who's judging us and all those kind of things. And people always say they're afraid if we start believing in that, then people are going to do all kinds of horrible things and everyone's just going to mm -hmm. run up. Like we need these rules to keep people in line and safe. Mm -hmm. But I would say that the religious teaching that we're born with this original sin and not really good people and have to be baptized and do all this stuff to make up for it is actually false teaching. Because if you observe human behavior in an emergency, whether mm -hmm. it's, a car accident or something as big as 9-11 or um, any of the tragedies that our, our world has seen, you always see people running toward. I mean, how many instances of heroism and self-sacrifice and the purest love you can imagine have we heard that happened on 9-11 in those towers of people sacrificing their own lives, going back for people in wheelchairs or whatever it was. They didn't do that. I guarantee you, they did not do that because they were afraid if they didn't, they were going to go to hell. It was mm -hmm. their natural human instinct. When you see someone suffering, when people see a dog drowning, you see all kinds of videos of people tying ropes together and people swimming out and making a chain just to get the dog out. We do the same thing for human beings. That's our instinct. So mm -hmm. I would say that's another falsehood we've been fed is we have to have all these rules and we have to be afraid of God. Otherwise we'll just run amok and we can't believe in reincarnation because then we'll just be bad, bad, bad and say, well, I can do it better next time I come or something like that. From my observing of human beings, that does not hold water. There's some people who are really lost and they're not really good at being human beings and can be very cruel and will look at any opportunity to take advantage of other people. One thing that is happening today, this inflation, I mean, every, everything's shrinking, 12 packs are eight packs, prices are going up, you know, nothing, graham crackers, I bought graham crackers and they're smaller. And so, of course, we're well trained to blame the opposite political party. It's because of them. It's because of that president. I challenge you before you say that again to look up what the net profits of that company were last year. Because mm. I promise you, they weren't in the red. They're way in the black. What has happened is greed has become acceptable. Greed has yeah. become legislated. So it's greed. It's not this politician that's in power, that politician that's in power. It's that corporations have been enabled to just feed their greed, feed their profits. We're not bad people. 
We just need to be more aware and start questioning things and stop falling for the, look at this shiny thing over here, it's immigrants, oh, it's uh, the gays, it's abortion. It's none of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Look at the people who are making the decisions about where you can live, how much money you can make, what your health care will be, what your taxes are. Look how they're living. Mm -hmm. They're not laying awake praying to God their car doesn't break down because they can't afford to fix it. Mm -hmm. We're being played and we really need to be aware of that and start connecting with each other because that's really where the power lies is when we start asking questions and saying, you know, this doesn't really make sense. This doesn't really hold water and then start uniting with each other. That's why they're keeping us distracted with other things so that we don't really look at where not only the problem starts, but where it can be rectified. Yes, I totally agree with that. I, I think that that's actually been verbalized. They've they've come out with video footage and audio footage and, and written statements of people who've said exactly that. It's a strategy to keep us distracted overly worked, overly exhausted. So we don't have time to pay attention to what's really going on with politics, because if we did, we would have a lot to say and we would speak up in our best interest and things would be very, very different. So it, this isn't to be um, overwhelming or like fear blasting. It's, it's just to say that there is another way that we can live on this planet together. Again, it's not about utopia. It's not about being perfect. It's about it being so much better than it is now. Mm -hmm. But part of that is, is us asking questions and giving ourselves permission to look again, to ask, to, to take another source. And to know that I understand that's scary. It's very scary when you take a belief that you've grown up with and you start to examine it. There's parts in us that will react very strongly because you don't know what's on the other side. Um, that work is called deconstruction. And one of the images I like to use is of like a house of cards, you know, that you, you put one right. card and one card and it's beautiful, but a gust of wind or a slight tug on a card and the whole thing falls apart. And I really do think that for some people, their reality structure is a house of cards and they're terrified of things being tugged. And so they react firmly. No, don't, don't talk about that. Don't do this. But the beauty is when the house of cards falls, you may have a moment where you feel disillusioned, but then you can create a structure that's flexible, that's much more sustainable, that's able to grow and move. I like to use the, the image of instead of a house of cards, it's like a human body, you know, balancing on one foot and falling down, but you pick yourself back up again. And, and you just keep growing and you keep learning. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really do. I really do think that whether it's political or economic or religious, um, looking again and opening our mind up as scary as it is. And what you find scary now, you won't find scary in five years. You, you'll create that room inside of yourself to expand and expand and expand and I don't know anyone who's gone on that journey who hasn't been glad that they did. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. I don't know anyone either who started asking, asking questions and listening to what was in their own soul rather than just following blindly along to mm -hmm. tradition hasn't come out better and stronger yeah. on the other side. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a really, really good point. Well, I think the first step anyone can take, certainly, and this is something I have to keep doing myself, is, you know, before you knee-jerk reaction when you hear this, that, and, and they're blaming whatever the flavor of the day is to blame, this is why this is, this is why that is, do some research, not research on the news websites that you always watch, but actually look, like I said, look at these companies and say, well, what did they actually make last year? Do they really need to raise prices? Or is it just, this is an opportunity for them to be a little greedy? That That's one of the most important things we could do is to start asking questions. Why do I believe what I believe? Is this really true for me? Because 
you'll find that the more you start asking questions, if you really sit quietly and wait for answers, you might be surprised at how much your thinking starts to turn and how much, you know, they feed that simmering pot of anger, everything like, I have to stay off the, the internet sometimes because yeah. it's all it is, is be afraid, be afraid, be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. Everything, like every day it's a bombardment of fear, which is perfect because if we're afraid, then we're very controllable. I don't want to be controlled anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm done just following along. If people want to call me names or, or write horrible things in the comments, have at it. Have at it because I just... I refuse to conform anymore. I, I refuse to be a good little girl and go mm -hmm. along to get along because if this world was really set up for our benefit and if it was really set up by people who really loved and cared for each other, it would look a whole lot different. Like you said, it is possible. 32 other countries have health care and some of them have a, a, a lot lower um financial flow than we do. We're one of the richest countries. We can have universal health care. Yeah. It's just so many people are making money off of them, not us not having it, including, like I said, how do you think these wages stay so low? Because people take crappy jobs so they can say, well, at least I have insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, when women came into the workforce, if we were truly a society that loved and supported each other and equality for both sexes, we would have said, Okay, women are in the workforce now. All right, well, they've been doing child care. So now, as a company, we're going to have to start having on-site child care. We're going to have, you know, they can bring their children here. That, that'll be part of our package. Our employees will be so much happier, so much healthier. Um, you know, they'll have more money to, to spend. There, there's, there are solutions, mm -hmm. but a lot of those solutions involve Big corporations and companies and CEOs having less money. They're mm -hmm. not going to volunteer. They're not no. going to say, you know what? I'm going to give up my salary. You know what? The board has decided we're going to take $2 billion less this year so that people can live. That's not going to happen. We have to do it. And we can only do it by starting with ourselves. Can't change the world. You want to change the world, change yourself. So instead of your knee-jerk reaction of believing whatever anybody's feeding you, Get quiet. Start asking yourself some questions. Who's benefiting, benefiting from this? Mm -hmm. Who's really benefiting? Because mm -hmm. I promise you, if a person is preaching hatred and division, they are benefiting from keeping you afraid and angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's all I got. You got anything else, Siri, to close us out? Oh, I, I think that's... I think that's great stuff. It's just, it's just a reminder that at the end of the day, I think the best path is be gentle with yourself and be gentle with others. And I think a compassionate world is, is the way we want to move towards. And so if anyone's answer of, Oh, that's just the way it is. Any callousness or hardness or cynicism, I get it, but that is not the highest way. The yeah. highest way is always compassion, collaboration, wisdom, gentleness, um, and I, I think we can make steps in our own lives toward that and want that for other people as well. And that God, higher source, whatever you want to call it divine, um, is what I've encountered in the quiet spaces. Never encountered this judgmental God who had rules for me and was going to burn me up like no. an overcooked hot dog if I didn't follow certain rules. <laughs> So I found this thing. I tried so hard to find the author and I saw it on a bunch of different people's websites and posts, <clears throat> excuse me, but I don't know who the actual author is. So I'm, I'm going to read it because I thought it was so powerful. The title of it is Girl. Mm. And I encourage you to please try and find out who wrote this because it's so profound. So this is the name of it, it's called Girl. I saw her sitting there, a younger, smaller version of me at nine years old, sitting on my childhood bed. I slowly walked to her, knelt. I took her hands into mine. She looked up at me and with a small voice asked, does it get any better? I squeezed her hands, not for a long time. 
She closed her eyes and tears streamed down her face. I let go of her hands and placed mine around her face. Does anyone end up saving us? She softly asked. I smiled and said, yes. She then looked at me hopeful. Who saves us? She asked. I smiled even bigger. We do. We save ourselves. Mm. And boy, if that isn't, that's it right there. We need to heal our own pain. We need to mm -hmm. go inside ourselves. We need to stop following dangling carrots and blaming the people. The people in charge want us to blame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's not it. Yeah. Get quiet. Look deeper. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. up to us. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, Siri, my darling, once again, thank you so much for all your insights and your wisdom and your beautiful spirit. And if people want to find out more about you, where can they go? They can check me out at SiriStrumman.com and see what I'm doing. Uh, links to my own YouTube channel and other things that I'm up to. Um, that's a great place to start. Okay, thank you so much, Siri. Thank you.